Hey folks, Steve here with another Nations in Arms video. We are now going to be taking a look at Autumn 1792 in the War of the First Coalition scenario. Now, last couple of videos were very long because we went through all the kind of major phases and how to move, fight, siege. We showed a lot of things in detail, and I'm going to probably start to rein that in a little bit, starting with this video. Um... But we'll see. I'm sure I'm going to waffle on it a little bit because I know some of you guys really like to see the full thought process, the important battles, um, the mechanics of doing different things. So we'll, we'll see. But I do aim to try to get through, if I can, all of the autumn turn in one video, even if it's kind of a long one. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Now, uh, in that previous uh, turn, the first turn, summer 1792, there were a few restrictions in play. Each stack could only activate once. There was no forced march, which is, you know, choosing to activate again in a turn and suffer potential attrition for doing so. Um, so everybody kind of did what they could. And what we've seen was uh, Teschen coming into France, uh, pushing de Maurier back with some losses, uh, destroying the fort at Lille, de Maurier grabbing some forces um, from further south, coming back and managing to push Teschen back. Uh, here, Clairfate had managed to push the French back, uh, who ended up pulling back to Paris uh, to try to protect it better and leave Raz, uh, Raz behind here. Um, that's how you pronounce that city, apparently. Uh, that fort to maybe slow somebody down or at least keep them busy uh, for a moment. Um, we had Montesquieu move from the south up to kind of be a reserve force. And then uh, Brunswick had come down, the Prussian leader, and was starting to beat up on these French forces, but in a series of uh, important maneuvers, uh, the remnant French forces got together, counterattacked, and actually forced the Prussians back and demoralized them. Um, so Brunswick's stack has been, hit, you know, Heavily depleted, but there are a number of other reserve stacks nearby, uh, which means that this whole area is going to continue to be an important one. One that the French are just kind of barely holding on, like they've, they've suffered some losses, but they've sort of punched back. But the endurance is going to be the problem. Can they hold on? Because of that, and because we're moving Montesquieu up, the southern area has been a little, not super active. We did have uh, Anselme uh, come in and take Nice. Um, Coley is still in Turin, but the Austrians are starting to send, uh, some force down here to kind of push the French back out and potentially be attacking, uh, into Southern France, uh, which is a dangerous, uh, a dangerous area because we just don't have a lot here yet. So the French are certainly feeling, uh, pressured and the allies are feeling maybe a little frustrated with the lack of progress, um, the fact that they got pushed back out, uh, but, but so far you know, an even contest, but things are going to continue to morph politically um, as we go. So in terms of starting this turn, there's going to be a few things different. So this is our first turn where we're actually going to play uh, a full game turn, meaning we start with the diplomacy phase, then the initiative phase, uh, and all the way through, and everybody, if they want to, uh, take that potential attrition, they can activate again um, twice in the given phase, or the, the season, I should say. So, a lot more to look at. We're also going to be dealing with the potential for winter uh, quarters chip coming up in the in initiative pool, so we'll talk about that. So, real quick, um, I just wanted to show, you know, this sequence of play. So, the diplomacy phase is... Um, can be very involved depending on what's going on. So if we say the game turn is going to start with the diplomacy phase, first, if we were playing a big multiplayer game, we would probably have time for negotiations. We're not going to do that here. I think this scenario is pretty much, you know, straightforward for all of this. For event cards, we can play additional event cards uh, now, but no more than one public event per block. So if you're playing cards that are not public event, I guess you can play as many as you want. This is our opportunity to play uh, the Committee of Public Safety if we want, but I don't want to do it yet. I don't want to do it yet. Because as soon as we play this, the uh, opposite side will be able to play 
uh, the King of France is executed. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to do that yet. Um, because that would bring in Britain and I want to, uh, stall, uh, that as much, uh, as we can. Um, and if I look at the order that we would play these in, just try to make sure I understand it, it would be France, then Britain. Yeah, so we would we would be playing Committee of Public Safety. They would play uh, King of France executed, and then, um, yeah, from, from there, yeah. I think I've got that right. Well, I guess it's actually Austria. See, this is the weird thing with this, is the, the order of operations here. Um, It says, other event cards may be kept by the player and played at the moment he deems most appropriate. So, <laughs> this is one of these weird things. I guess we could play this kind of whenever, right? I guess. <laughs> I, I guess. We could even play it, I guess, during the operations phase uh, later. Like, we could do it towards the end of a turn. It's just when, it's, when we can play it whenever we want to. But the public events are played during the events phase. So there, if if folks have played this game and have a different opinion on how to interpret this role, uh, please let me know. But it sounds like, again, if, if the card is a public event card, here's an example of one that we, we house ruled that this was played at the beginning of the game. If it's a public card, you play it during this diplomacy phase. One per side or player, depending on how many players you're playing with. Um, or I think it's just one per side, one per camp, um, one public event per season. So you can hold on to some, play them in the summer, uh, autumn, winter, and then in the spring you get more, you play it, play it, play it, play it. Where a card like this apparently can just be played whenever, I guess, whenever it's appropriate. And because it doesn't have public, I can just play it I don't know, during the victory phase, like before the start of a spring turn, because that's when it matters, right? We want to play this card before the next spring turn so we get to pick an event card, right? That's when it's important to play this. But if we play it, the King of France uh, being executed card will be played probably right afterwards, um, which will bring Britain in, and we don't want to do that before the British have a chance uh, to do something to us. So I feel like if I'm if I'm interpreting this right, it will be most advantageous for the French to play the Committee of Public Safety card at the time of, of our choosing um, at the very end of the winter turn. So not this turn, but the winter turn, which means the French will not play any event cards right now, and the Coalition basically doesn't have any cards that they can actually play. So, so for right now, anyway, it seems like uh, we're, we're done with this phase. We're going to play some event cards. Um, no event cards will be played. We're not going to have Spanish instability because that only happens in 1805 or beyond. Same thing with the Turkish stuff. Do we have any declarations of war? That's sort of the next thing. And here, the declarations of war... Uh, basically, if we declare war on a minor, let's say we're, we're talking about France, let's say we declared war on Geneva, well then that space would be uh, uh, coalition controlled, and if the country that we declared war on had units, they would be placed. So if we declared war on Switzerland, they, they would become controlled by the coalition, and then the coalition player would set up the Swiss units, and there are some Swiss units. Uh, there's a couple miners like Geneva that don't have any units, so the French can kind of decide to go and declare war on them sort of whenever, but so long as it's neutral, uh, this is technically like it's a block. You know, we, we can't send the Piedmontese because this is a neutral little city-state area, um, and the French are kind of weak in this theater, so I don't think they're going to declare war on Geneva, though that's kind of, you know, one option. We'll wait to do that. Um, I think historically the French didn't mess around with this until 1795. I'm, think, I'm thinking we're good to just ignore it for now. Um, any other minor countries that are not already controlled on the board? I mean, there's only a handful, and it does make sense for the French to declare war on them, and I don't think it makes sense for Prussia 
or Austria to declare war on us, like the Hansa, Mecklenburg, you know, they're neutral. Denmark is neutral. Sweden is neutral. But right now, I mean, who's going to declare war on those guys? All you're doing is adding it to the enemy. France is already kind of at war with everybody that matters right now. Um, and again, we would save these guys for later when our position down here in the southern department is a little more um, stable, we'll say. So I don't think France is going to declare war on anyone. And then likewise, uh, I don't think the Prussians or the Austrians are going to declare war on any new factions uh, in the given situation. It just doesn't make sense to do that. So that's kind of easy peasy. And now we're going to get to uh, influencing neutral minor countries. And this is where we're going to have some new mechanics to talk about here, guys. Now, it's going to be somewhat limited. Um, basically, each side will get to attempt to influence a minor country for free, and then they can spend money to have some additional attempts. The thing that I would throw out there uh, is that France doesn't have any money, neither does Spain, though Spain is maybe less important for this. But Austria, Prussia, and Britain do have money. The only active played major countries right now are Prussia and Austria. So it's basically going to be up to the coalition player to decide if they're going to spend some of their remnant money that they started the scenario with to influence any other minor countries. But again, there's only so many miners here, um, and not all of them make a whole lot of sense to try to influence, to, to be quite honest. So um, let me take a look and think through that, and uh, we'll come back and maybe demonstrate how some of this will work. Okay, this is going to be a pretty quiet diplomacy influencing phase, I think, but let's just kind of talk about it. So the way it works is each uh, player in the diplomacy order, uh, because we're playing this as a technically two-player game, it's really going to be uh, the coalition and then France, depending on which power uh, of the coalition will be choosing to influence any, any minors. Um, you, everybody gets a free attempt, so you don't have to spend any money, you just get to pick one roll the dice. Uh, you could then spend money to try to increase your die roll modifier. Uh, and then there's a few other modifiers that could apply. You roll 2d6, and you need a 12 or higher. Now, 12, obviously, is very difficult to achieve on just a 2d6. Um, so very unlikely. If you can get some bonuses, you can shift that bell curve and maybe have an, an okay chance of getting a 12 or higher. Um, though it, it will never be greater than the 50%, I don't think, um, just the way the math works out and the, what modifiers you can actually get. Um, those modifiers, there's a, a bonus for certain factions. This is on the uh, Diplomacy Modifiers chart. So you can see some factions, like, okay, you get, you get a plus two, plus one for certain you know countries uh, trying to influence them. Uh, so that's a, a little bit of an advantage for certain things. Uh, then you can spend uh, two money, pounds, whatever denomination you want to use. Two, uh, for two money, you can increase your die roll modifier by one on minor countries, or four, you can spend four to increase an attempt on a major power. And the order of operations here in the diplomacy phase is we, we worry about minor powers first and then the majors. Um, so you can actually burn a lot of money trying to get that shift. And in my mind, it is difficult to actually achieve something with diplomacy. So it's just just, just difficult, um, ultimately. Uh, now, the way influencing miners works is you can really only attempt to influence uh, minor countries that are currently not controlled. Later in, uh, like, the 1805 campaign... Uh, Britain can influence non-satellite minor countries that are part of the continental system of France. But none of that really applies here. So generally, diplomacy is only going to work against unplayed, neutral minor countries or major powers in this scenario. And even then, there won't be many for much longer. Um, so the, the only real uncontrolled minor countries that are kind of up for grabs right now, it's like, you know, we could maybe pick Geneva, though I don't see a reason to really do that. Um, it's not clear to me, like, not every miner has a diplomacy chit, like, you know, here's Morocco's. Geneva doesn't have one, but Geneva is still listed on the minor powers charts as, like, a faction that you can influence. And I was trying to figure out, is there any restriction on trying to influence um, 
those areas that don't have a marker. And I think you still can. It's just the game doesn't have a marker for them. Um, so you can see I had the, the markers. You know, Prussia's already got control of a whole bunch. Britain's got control of a whole bunch. Uh, Austria has control of a whole bunch as part of the, the HRE, the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so the only options that I can really see, uh, there's Morocco and Algeria down uh, off camera. I'm not going to pan around for that. I don't think that's super valuable. Malta, probably not super valuable. doesn't really affect anything of significance. Um, and then we have some countries that are sort of uh, up here in terms of minors. So we've got Denmark, Mecklenburg, Hansa, uh, Sweden. Now, out of those, uh, I think Denmark and Sweden have units that could come onto the board. So it's sort of the, the, the decision making here is, well, you get a free attempt. You know, try who you can for the free attempt, sure. Um, and then do you want to spend any, any, any of your money? So for France, they're really going to get one free attempt, and they don't have the money to do anything. So it's like a freebie shot. Just try to get something, right? For the coalition player, it's how much of the Prussian and Austrian money uh, that they have saved do we want to spend on doing anything with diplomacy? Now, as I look at the map, I think Sweden and Denmark are kind of interesting options at this point, but I don't necessarily see them as critical. That money could be better spent by Austria and Prussia on units like, hey, some stuff's actually very expensive in the production phase, like a supply train, I think, is like eight production. A, a engineer unit, which can be very, very powerful and useful, is also eight. So for like Austria, if we spend any of Austria's money, we're giving up the opportunity to build another supply depot or an engineer or a couple steps of inventory for a possible improved chance to bring a minor country on. And that minor country might only have a few steps of infantry. So I'm not really feeling like either side has a lot of desire or even ability to heavily influence miners at this point. So we'll, we'll go ahead and just kind of handle this. We'll let, um, if I look at the, the diplomacy order, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, it is Spain, Turkey, Prussia, Austria, Russia, France, and Britain. And because Britain is unplayed, it's really the, the coalition player who's going to go first. I think, I think, um, we're going to go ahead and just see if we can influence Denmark for no reason other than uh, it's worth a shot. <laughs> and uh, we basically need to roll boxcars for this one. Uh, we're not going to spend any money. We're just going to let this one go. And whew, I rolled an 11. It's not enough. But that was awfully close. That was awfully close. So that was the freebie. That was a failure. Um, trying to see if there's any, you know, maybe if, if we had spent the money, guys, we could have got Denmark in. And I didn't do it. So, yeah, all right. Uh, now France can pick a freebie. And, I, you know, um, there is a plus one for France in Denmark. So we'll go for Denmark, too. Uh, but that's a fail. All right, the freebies are done. Do we want to spend any of our hard-earned cash on any other attempts? Only the coalition player can do it. I think we'll say no. We're going to say no. And that's kind of it for influencing minors. Now, the next one that comes up that could be important is influencing major powers. Now, uh, most of the time, the game is structured that, like, Britain can't be influenced by... Uh, diplomacy action, and over the course of the different rules revisions of this game, for this scenario, there have been times where Britain is just straight up not allowed to be influenced diplomatically, but as of the 2019 reprint and then the Banania rules just incorporating that, uh, technically the coalition can try to pull Britain in on their side. The advantage to doing that now is that if they can bring them in now, the French have to deal with the British and her allies earlier than if the card play would bring them out. But again, we'd have to spend a lot of money. Um, we would need to roll, you know, box cars, or we'd be spending all of our hard-earned cash trying to have some even remote chance of bringing Britain in. To be honest, I don't think it's worth it. <clears throat> I think in this specific scenario, the card plays of the Committee of Public Safety and the King of France being executed will be enough to bring Britain and eventually Spain into the war just fine. And I think, you know, given we know that that's going to happen or 
pretty strong chance that's going to happen. Uh, Prussia and Austria are not going to spend their money for that. They're going to save it. And when we get to the spring phase of uh, this coming year, um, I, I believe they get to hold on to that money uh, and have that part of their bank when we do production and they'll be able to maybe buy some additional units or something. Um, that I think is what we're going to do. I just don't see, I don't see the benefit in trying to make all of that, uh, work and try to get the, uh, the guys in early. It's just going to be too expensive and we might waste all that money. And, and that's kind of what I'm thinking is going to happen. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Never mind. I'm sorry, guys. There's a note in the rules here about treasury. At the end of the winter season, the major powers except Britain lose all unspent resources in their treasury. So actually, if we don't use it, we lose it. Well, maybe we should then. Um, maybe we should. So let's figure out how we want to do this. Um, we're going to have uh, Prussia spend four spend more money for an attempt on Britain. And unfortunately, we need to roll box cards. We don't get it. Um, and then next we would have... Oh, well, we only get the... Okay. All right. We're going to take that back. We're going to have Austria spend out its money. And uh, I'll take that die roll back. I don't care. Um, I'm just playing myself. Who cares? Uh, Austria is going to spend four money to attempt to influence Britain, and they're going to spend four money to get a plus one, and basically just means 11 or 12 die roll, Britain will enter early. Uh, I rolled a nine, so we got a ten, but ten is not enough. So Austria, they're going to lose the money anyway, try to buy, uh, you know, spend money on diplomacy and embassy to bring Britain in to join the fray. And Britain is not willing to yet, expecting maybe that France can turn into uh, something of a tempered constitutional monarchy still, that there's still a way for the, for the royal family of France to uh, come to some accord with the uh, changing revolution in, in play, I guess, is the way to look at that. Uh, France can't influence any majors. Uh, so that's the end of the diplomacy phase, guys. So it's good just to talk about how it works, even though we didn't do much of it. Um, but it's worth talking it through. In other scenarios, the diplomacy rules are going to matter a little bit more. Uh, but now let's talk about the initiative phase and how it's different this turn. Okay, so for the initiative phase uh, for this turn, we've got the cup loaded with all the good, fun stuff. Um, the important thing uh, right now that differs is we are going to use a new chit, which I have not put in the cup yet, which is the winter quarters chit. This goes into the cup uh, every other season except for summer. So I'm going to drop that in there, give everything a good little shake. So what does this mean? Um, so in summer, like last turn, we, we play every chit in the cup. Uh, and, this, and the winter quarters chit is not in there at all. So you just, you know you're going to play everything. It's just a matter of timing. Now for autumn, we have the winter's uh, quarters chit in there, which is going to mean that the turn could end without every activation chit actually being played. So now introduces a bit of fog of war, and this is abstracting uh, not even necessarily winter weather, but like rain and thunderstorms and things that could inhibit operations over the course of that season. And so uh, the way it works is, and this varies by turn, but at least for autumn, if we pull the winter's quarter, winter quarters chip, we're going to set it aside for a second, and we're going to put it back into the cup after we draw another uh, another chip that is you know usable, right? And then the winter quarters chip it goes back in. The second time we draw it, uh, the activate activation phase ends, and we always ignore the winter's quarter chip if it is drawn first. So if we draw it first, it just goes right back into the cup and is ignored. That doesn't count as a true draw. So I guess technically what I should have done, see, now, now I'm a smart guy, guys. I, I learn. I swear I do. 
I shouldn't even have put the winner course chit in until after we pulled our first chit from the cup. But if we draw it, we're just going to put it right back. We'll draw something else. But again, first time we draw that chit, we ignore it, and then we pull and we get an, you know, another activation. <clears throat> but the second time we draw it, uh, then the activation ends. And what that could mean is, just again, this is the variability, maybe we end up playing every chit before the second winter's quarter's draw happens, right? Or we pull a chit, that's a land impulse, we do it. Then we pull winter quarters, and uh, that's the first time we draw it. And if we pull it again, maybe you only have uh, one land action that takes place. Or I guess a, a minimum of two, I guess. So the first one, which can't be winter quarters, then we pull winter quarters, uh, we hold it until we pull another activation shit, and then we put it, the winter quarters shit back in the cup, and then we could draw it again. So, so somehow it's either going to be a minimum of, you know, two activations, uh, one on each side, probably, is how that's going to work. Um, probably. The neutral markers may come into play there. Um, or, you know, maybe everything gets pulled. But we just don't know, which means in terms of the, you know, situation on the map, if you don't know when the turn's going to end, you better do everything that you can, seek to achieve the objectives you want before it's too late and you miss the opportunity. So there's a little bit of a driver right there. If we look at like autumn and say, hey, we're, we're in September, October is going to start getting messy. We got to do something. And for the coalition, that may mean destroying as many, you know, French armies as they can to put pressure on them um, before they have a chance to bounce back. Uh, and we're still using all the same units that we started uh, the previous turn with, essentially. We're not going to have any new units join the map uh, except for, you know, um, powers changing sides uh, or, or, or whatever until we get to spring when there's a production phase and everybody rebuilds up armies and all of that. So all that's going to come into play. So with that in mind, guys, uh, now we're going to go to the activations phase and I'm going to draw a chit. We're going to give this a good... A little, little shake of this could hurt ears, so I'm going to try to shake it back here. Make sure it's shaking nice and good, and we'll pull, we'll pull our uh, first shit out of the cup. And what do we get? Neutral, neutral land. Well, I don't think there's much that we can really do there. Um, Hmm. Um, this is another one of those gamey things where technically if I read the rules as written, France could send the Spanish armies south away from the border, but I feel like that, that's not really fair. That's stupid to do. Like I, that doesn't make sense to me. So, um, the neutral landmarker, I don't, I don't think there's much to do. Um, I think that, I just think given the circumstances, I'd probably allow like the Hanover unit to move over here, maybe, or something. Um, but then we leave the capital unattended, so maybe we just leave it alone. I don't know. Landmarker's done, guys. I, nothing to say. Not much to do. Let's go. Let's pick a different shit. This, I think the neutral markers make a lot more sense in a multiplayer game because there are usually some forces, some powers that are neutral or in their own block, and they're going to go do their own stuff. Here, it's kind of a dead shit. Uh, especially in this scenario. Um, there's just not as much to do. Um, okay. Uh, now we pull Empire Land 2. So really, the French Land 2 marker, which means uh, everybody with a 2 and up can move. And that's most of the French units on the board. So these guys can all activate. This guy can't. Uh, this guy cannot. This guy can. Montesquieu can. Lumenville can. Yeah. Uh, any, any, almost pretty much everybody, every land unit that's a leader, or every land stack that has a leader is going to be able to activate. And so now the decision making for the French will be, um, do we not move anybody? Or it's something we should keep in mind is, do we not activate somebody uh, because we want to 
uh, have them as a reserve force. The only problem is, you know, we will know right now that if we don't activate somebody, the twos, or the two leaders that we have here, if we don't activate them now, we're going to have to wait for the one chit to come up. And we're not, we're not even going to be sure that we'll get the one chit to come up as the land, as the land marker for the, for the French at some point. So um, I need to think about this. I know who can activate and I, and I want to think through what they're going to do, but we'll come back and we'll start, uh, start operating uh, just as soon as I do that for you. It'll be an instant. Okay, guys, so here's what I think I'm going to do. I think we're going to leave Anselm here where he's at um, because shortly we're going to probably see uh, Wurttemberg here snake on down. And if he tries to go at Anselm, he'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, and he will not have enough movement to actually attack Anselm. If we try to take him to Genoa, or we try to go to Turin, he's going to be able to uh, counter move, and he's going to be much stronger than poor Anselm here uh, with only a militia core that has a minus one as its combat modifier. So I think he's fine to stay here for the time being, and we'll see how the rest of the situation develops. Um, further north, Here's the, the situation. Um, the uh, the uh, Brunswick army is demoralized, so it would be fun to uh, activate Biron and try to chase after Brunswick. Now, these guys could, you know, this guy here and this guy here could try to intercept. Um, but it would be nice to try to go after him while he's demoralized. The thing is, if you're uh, if a force is demoralized, it can pretty much auto evade combat. At least that's how I read the rule. Um, let's see demoralization effects. A demoralized force can automatically avoid combat if attacked again. So all that we would really do is chase him away, and then maybe we would be able to uh, take the fortress at Mons, which would be a nice pickup. But I don't think that's the most important thing that Biron could be doing right now. Let me zoom in so this is a little bit easier to, to parse. So, alternatively, Biron could uh, and should focus on these other coalition stacks to make use of whatever advantage is feasible and kind of put them... Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what the right metaphor is here, but, you know, swat away the flies, right? We took the big one out. Let's try to shut down the smaller armies so that they have a harder time responding. If these guys can co-locate, they're going to be a more potent force, so we should defeat them in detail, right? Sounds like sound strategy. Even if it means we leave fortresses like Strasbourg or Metz kind of empty for the moment, um, I think that's okay. We can, we can always uh, surge back, and that's why we have Montesquieu as a backup force here. So I think that's the first thing we want to try, and then I guess depending on how those combats go, That'll dictate the urgency behind uh, Demurier coming into Flanders and trying to attack uh, Teshin, because uh, Teshin has a potent force as well. So this is really the sort of the lineup here. Now, for Biron, uh, I think it makes the most sense to try to attack uh, Clairfate here. Uh, he seems to be the most potent force, and we don't want him to sync up with uh, Walmoden. So he's got a train, he's got an infantry corps, and he's got... Uh, a Curious Sears uh, core, but it's just three steps, which should give us some level of an advantage. So he, we should have Biron go one to Metz, uh, two, three to the forest, one, two, three, four to attack here. Um, alternatively, we could go one, two, three, four and have combat here. But I think I'd rather, if for some reason Biron is defeated, that he moves back to the forest and then can intercept into the Mets hex or is this a more central position right now. So it kind of feels like we're giving up on this nub of France here, but that's only for the moment uh, because if each of these stacks is reduced and demoralized, um, even when these guys over to the east start coming back over, um, it'll be a weaker force to then continue to attack, defeat, demoralize. Uh, as best as we can over the course of these next couple of turns until the spring interphase, 
uh, when things will get a little more interesting. So that's what we'll do. So we're going to activate uh, Biron. Just going to double check. So he's got one, two, three, four, five steps with Kellerman as a subordinate leader. He'll go one, two, three. Now we could have Claire Fate uh, try to intercept, but I don't think it's likely to be very successful, but it might be worthwhile to try it. Um, let's see, he has... Uh, let's see. He doesn't have light cavalry, so that would not help him. Sort of a key thing. Um, intercepting leaders, all the same value. He have to introduce two. Entry intercept. Uh, so he'd have a one. Well, he yeah. If he fails to intercept, is there any bad thing for it? No, doesn't look like so. It's worth a shot. We'll give it a shot. Um, let's see. That is nine. No, he fails to intercept and then Biron uh, attacks. So that's one, two, three, four movement points. Technically, Biron will have two left over. If he wins the combat, he'll only have one movement point left over, um, which means he won't be able to get back into the forest hex. Um, but I, I think that's okay for the moment. So, yeah, we'll have this, uh, we'll have this combat here. So, so I did forget um, that while uh, Clairfate failed to intercept into the woods as Biron uh, came his way, he can still potentially avoid combat. And so, in this situation, is the first time that contact area matters. A contact area in game terms is meant to represent, it. I guess it's almost a Zoc, um, but not quite. So, like a zone of control. So, uh, as Biron were to come here, uh, Clear Fate can uh, try to avoid combat, but his destinations can only be um, here, here, or here, if he does. It can't be here, Right, so only here, here, or here, but not here, because the contact area that Biron's entering the hex from is the hex side he crosses and each adjacent. Um, Clairfate would like to come here, because if he were able to avoid combat in the woods, uh, Walmoden could potentially join him in a march to the sound of guns, that kind of thing, but he is not able to do that because of the direction the French are coming from. So there's just one way that, again, representation of different maneuver uh, positioning factors come into play here. And so uh, Clairfate does not have that option. So uh, he's, he, I think he is going to try to avoid combat. So he would have wanted to intercept because that gives him a value. I think he's got a much better odds of avoiding combat, and he would rather uh, not get caught up with Biron without that bonus, I think. The, the, the die roll modifiers in the potential combat are too close. Um, and the Austrians don't think that they're going to do very well. So we'll try. Um, and let's see. Uh, that's a success. So because we add his initiative modifier, so he rolled an 8 plus 3 is 11. So he comes up to here. So again, when we look at, you know, are we going to be able to uh, catch him? 1, 2, 3, 4... So we come in, try to intercept again. Can he do that? Maybe, but no. So one, two, three, four, five. So once again, um, he's got a challenge, but he could potentially avoid to here. So he'll give it a shot. Uh, but he fails. So. Despite his best efforts, Biron manages to catch Claire Fate, and we're going to have a combat. <clears throat> I sort of had the uh, combat modifiers drawn up uh, ahead of time, just figuring that we would end up in this state. Um, so what, what do we have? Uh, well, we have the uh, French have uh, artillery superiority. Uh, they have uh, Kellerman as a subordinate leader that they would 
toss in to affect combat, especially since Viron is not very good himself. Um, and uh, there's another one. Uh, when you work out the steps comparison, the French end up with a plus one for having rounding up to two to one odds. So they have a plus three. The Austrians have a plus one from Clear Fate's combat ability, and then uh, they can opt to have another plus two by making their Curious Sears their lead unit, which is kind of a tricky gamble here, but it's the only way uh, that the Austrians can potentially defeat Biron and uh, come out ahead in the victory comparison. Um, and I think he wants to try to do that. I think that's worthwhile to try. It's sacrificing a strong unit, but I, I think we want to do that. We want to try um, to shut things down. Now, because it's three steps to five, uh, this is still a skirmish battle, so it's not enough steps to be a minor battle. So, as it turns out, moral, morale checks are not going to matter for this. But it basically comes out to be an even die roll. Uh, 2d6 plus 3 to 2d6 plus 3 if I did all the calculations right. Not pretty sure that I did. So we'll go for the uh, the French first, and we'll see what we get. Uh, not particularly good. I rolled a 5 plus 3 is an 8, which is a 0 result. So much for that. And the Austrians uh, roll much better. They got an 8 plus... 3 is 11, which is a 1 star star. Uh, the star star doesn't matter, so uh, yeah, that's a step loss to the French. Their lead unit was just one of their infantry, so that is too bad. Um, and so they are going to have to fall back and stop their activation. So the Austrians managed to win that one, and they got away clean without losing a Curious Here step. So that went well. Um, that did go well for them. So we'll go ahead and put a uh, first activation marker on Biron, and that's definitely a tricky thing now because we, we have a situation where now we've got all this open space. We did not hurt that stack as much as we would have liked. Um, so that's... Ugh. Ugh, ugh, ugh. All right, well, um, let's see what we can do with Demurier. So... Uh, if we activate Demurier, what does he have? Um, oh, we got a... Our fortress remove marker. He's got one, two, three, four, five, six steps with a lead with a sub leader. Clear fate beside his engineers have one, two, three, four, five with a sub leader. Um, and one, one, two cavalry. Two artillery. Should have done this count better, guys. I'm sorry. One, two, one, two artillery. Hmm. It'd be a very even contest here um, between these two stacks. Oh, oh gosh, I forgot. We need to do a leader check for Kellerman as well. That's my bad, guys. I, I forgot about that. So we'll give a die roll, see what happens to Kellerman, because we used his combat bonus. We've got to roll a leader casualty check. And, okay, he's fine. So Kellerman is fine um, for now. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> um, I think we will try. Now, here's a couple of things that we can do with Teshem. We could try to avoid combat, and we could actually fall back to Antwerp and make it so that uh, in this scenario there's a special rule, basically, that if, uh, let's see, if France attacks or besieges Antwerp or Brussels, 
So if Teshin like retreats away to here here, the French can't come in there um, without making Britain activate against them. And I don't think they want to do that yet. I don't think they want to even deal with some, you know, British landing behind them way back here. Um, so I think I think Teshin's going to try to withdraw. Well, or will he? So here's the thing, I guess. If if he withdraws, De Maria would go one, two, three, four, and probably get clear fate. So maybe it's better that Teshin try to fight, and if he loses. He can retreat safely over here and not have to worry about it. So maybe they will fight. I think that's probably the better thing to do is to fight. Um, now, in this case, this is going to be a, a potent battle, right? We, we basically have six to five steps, so it's a minor battle. Morale will matter. Um, I think what we're going to have happen here is... Let's see, who, what's the lead unit for the... Austrians. Um, I think they're going to use their cavalry as their lead unit. And then artillery is the same. Uh, cavalry is the same. So there's no superiority bonus. Both leaders are going to have their values used. Um, so both will have leader checks to deal with. Um, so it actually comes out to be a slight Austrian advantage, um, just because, I'm just double checking this, the French will use their infantry as their lead unit, but it doesn't have a bonus yet. This question came up, somebody had asked, you know, why we weren't using the French bonus is because, um, we need the Carnot card to come up, special rule for this scenario. So in this case, uh, the Austrians actually do have the advantage because they're using their cavalry as their lead unit. So uh, the French have a 2d6 plus 2. The Austrians have a 2d6 plus 3 uh, in this. So there you go for the French. Uh, they rolled pretty well. They got a 9 plus 2 is 11, which is two step losses. So we'll remember that. And then the Austrians... Uh, roll much worse actually. Uh, they rolled a four plus three and a seven. So one step loss versus two step losses. So he's gonna have to take a step loss off the cavalry and I guess he'll lose infantry. So that sucks. Um, and then the French take a step loss. And we'll do the morale check here. Or, well, I guess we need to do the casualty checks too. So, uh, secondary leader for De Maurier is Luckner. We'll roll for him. He's fine. Secondary leader for Teshin is Argento. And Argento dies. Roll again for a non-army leader. Okay. So he's dead. We'll have to see if we can put a replacement leader in or not. Um, but now we're going to have to do a morale check on these guys. And uh, let's see. Well, the overall commander wasn't killed. All right, so what's the morale situation uh, like? So our dead infantry was a three. So we had more three steps. So the Austrian morale was a three. Um, it's a four for the leader. Um, and then back down to a three for uh, the loss difference. And they managed to avoid being demoralized with a die roll of two. And then uh, he can retreat two hexes. I think he's going to do that. And so we end up with, we did one, two for winning the combat. Um, and he can keep going. So one, two, three, four is probably what we want to do. Um
One, two. Clear Fate probably tries to get away. He succeeds. Um, so I think he probably pulls back here. So one, two, three, four. He could try to go, but then we've got a bigger army here. I think maybe he just goes five, six, and ends here for the moment. I think that's probably the best option that we've got. Um, and I know we're starting to run long here, guys. Uh, so now it's a question of do we have uh, Montesquieu activate? And I'm a little uncertain on this one. Um, he's only got, let's see, one, two, three, four. No, he's actually pretty strong. Um, so he could go one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, he can't get up here. Um, but it would be in a better position if he got up to Mets. So I, I do wonder, no, well, maybe, maybe we leave him there for now and just, ah, it's difficult guys. I don't know. I don't know. Um, let's just do it. Let's just get him up here and let him be done with an activation for now. So that we've got a, a decent line of forces here along the way. Um, and we did beat back the Austrians a little bit. So we feel pretty good. If we could have demoralized those guys, that would have been even better. But we just didn't get it. Um, and we'll leave this guy back in uh, Paris unactivated for the moment. And everything else is as good as we can get it. So I think that's enough for the French activation, the first activation. Let's go pull from the cup again. And see what we get. We pulled uh, Empire Naval. Well, let me see if there's anything worthwhile to achieve with that. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything worthwhile doing with the Naval right now. So we'll just go back to the cup again. And we get Coalition Land 2. Um, so this is a interesting, the back-to-back 2s, -back because the 2s allow a lot of people to activate. Um, so I think we're going to have a lot of straightforward moves here. Um, I think what we'll have first is Württemberg will advance and go one, two, three, four. We'll do five. We'll just do five. So we'll have him along the coast here and be done. And we may end up using a second activation with him in time. Uh, then we need to decide what to do with wor worms or, um, uh, I certainly like the idea. I, I think in the south we're fine. So let's send him moving towards overwhelming the French here. So let's see, he's still got his train. So we go one, two, three, four there for the time being. I think that's good enough. First activation marker. Note that we're using first activation markers now instead of activation over. Um, we've got uh, Blankenstein's small units here. And I think what we'll do... Um, or maybe we wait. Hmm. Let's activate the tour. He's got. Oh, he's only got two. Hmm. He's got two. Tricky, tricky. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll activate. Esterhazy first, and we'll have him move into Strasbourg for 1-2, and we'll do a siege 
attempt for three. And I think in this case, uh, there's going to be no die roll modifiers. Yeah, so Fortress 1, 2d6. Got a 6, no effect. Um, he'll go again. And maybe he needs to go again. 1, 2, 3, 4... Five. All right, so he got a seven plus two is nine, an assault. Huh. Well, I, I gotta say, these poor Austrians just aren't making any headway, guys. Um, they're not making any headway. So a failed assault there. Both ways. Um, so one last assault attempt here. Um, it's so funny how this is working. Uh, okay, so that should be... <laughs> Uh, he has failed to take it, and now has a Siege plus 4 marker there, um, which is interesting. And he is done activating, if it happens. Um, that's amusing. Uh, okay, so much for that. Um, hmm. I don't think we want to send Latour against... Montesquieu, he doesn't have enough. So what we may do is... just kind of get into a better position. So maybe what we'll do is one, two, three, four, five, six... Um, we can have these guys move into here, but they will integrate. We're going to lose this leader to the leader pool. And this will join the stack, but we're not going to be able to go again, I don't believe. And then we'll activate a tour. The one, two... Three, four, five, six. And then we'll activate Brunswick and see if we can't become remoralized. So let me take a look at how we do that. I think it's another check mechanic. Okay, so in looking at the uh, demoralized state of Brunswick, the way that this works is that um, we're basically going to do a basically a demoralization check, but in reverse, so it's a remoralization check. They call it a rally attempt. So Brunswick will activate here, and he will uh, attempt to rally. So this costs three movement points, which is uh, you know most of the movement points that his stack is going to have because they are operating with a supply baggage train. Um, he could leave that behind, I guess. And maybe he would if he were to go on the offensive, but he's going to spend three movement points. We're going to take a look at their morale. Um, I checked this off camera. So his base unit's morale is a three, plus one for his leadership. Combat ability is a four. Um, but then minus one because they are currently demoralized. So it is a... Uh, morale of three and so what we want to do is roll a die and get a three or less and they will be rallied and they get it i rolled a one so now uh he is 
morale, uh, moralized again, <laughs> rallied. So Brunswick says, come on, come on, guys, you, you can do it. We can do it. We can do it. And I do want to see, he doesn't have that many steps. He's got infantry, he's got some cavalry. Um, so he needs to try to do something. Uh, do I think he could face off against Montesquieu? Probably not well, but we could see. Um, we've got two different stacks of Austrian units here, so he's kind of well supported in case of a, uh, you know, march to the sounds of guns kind of thing. So I think maybe what we'll do, well, he can only get as far as here. I think, I think with this, he's just going to move like so and end his activation with the baggage train. Okay. Um, and then the rest of these guys, what do we want to do here? Um, well, these guys have some stacking problems, for one. Uh, we're not going to be able to combine these stacks. Which is a problem. Because we can't even really, I mean, to try to fight... So that's three, four steps. This is... Three steps... And even Walmoden is three steps. Maybe what we can do is try to uh, try to overwhelm the French somewhere. It's kind of tough to say. Um, we could probably use some other moves that are going to be easier. So one, two, three, four. Uh, five, six. And he's done. Yeah, maybe this is what we'll do. Um, he'll go one, two. And then, uh, would he want to intercept? Well... He could try, but I'm not sure that he's going to succeed at it. Because um, maybe what we can do is we can wear out the French here. Um, interception. Yeah, maybe we try. Don't make it. So then he attacks. And uh, let's see. So there will be... A one, I mean, let's just, let's just give it to him, right? Let's say one, two, three. Uh, the French would have... Oh boy, okay. Would have two. So it's just this this fight's just a refight of one that we've seen before. Um, the difference is the attacker and the defender uh, are swapped. But uh, I think I think they're hoping to just start attriting the French away because this is still a skirmish battle. One, two, three, four steps against three steps. We don't have a good enough leader to 
have a combined stack between these Aust Austrians and Prussians for stacking purposes, unfortunately. So uh, 2d6 plus 3 for the Austrians. That's 1 for their leader and 2 for their lead unit, the Curious Sears again. And they got a 5 plus 3 is 8 on the skirmish table is a zero. All right, so much for that. And the French have a plus two. Uh, so a seven. Okay. Um, I think they probably, let's see, oh, we got a leader check for Kellerman. And he's fine. So fine again. I haven't, we haven't lost very many leaders so far. So now we could do another combat, and I think I think we're going to do that. So, Austrians again. This time they got, let's see, a 7 plus 3 is 10, so a 0 plus. And the French got a 12. So they actually get a 1 result. So, the Austrians lose their Curious Sears and have to retreat. Um... See, can they retreat into a good spot? Um, I think they can go back here. And that's it for them. Or maybe they can just retreat back to here is probably the best thing. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. Uh, we'll roll leader casualty for the French again for Kellerman. And he survives again. Okay. Um, next, we'll have... Wall Moden kind of do something similar here. And we'll do one, two, three. We have a potential interception. Drop my die. Uh, not enough to intercept. And so, you know, what do we have here? We've got three. Oh, actually, you know what? Never mind. I don't think. I don't think we want this stack trying to do what I am trying to make him do. It might be better for Walmoden to tag up with Brunswick. And I think that's probably the better, better option. Um, so he would go one, two, three, four, and end up stacked um, with uh, Brunswick. We'd have to lose a leader, so we'll do that. Knocking stuff over here, guys. That's what happens when you clip your counters. They slide all around because the nubs aren't there to hold them up. Um, so this would be four. Uh, I guess I would leave maybe this guy behind. All right, hold on, guys. I gotta, I gotta mess with stuff. All right, I think I've got it now. So I had to have a, had to leave um, the one Hesse unit behind for stacking purposes uh, with Brunswick, but I think I've got it worked out the right way. I don't think a cavalry can absorb a detachment because um, a detachment, I think, is considered an infantry. So I'm gonna, I guess I need to look that up too. Um, yeah, it's an in yeah, infantry. So we can't have a detachment re replenish a cavalry, unfortunately. Um, okay, so um, then do we want to have Teshin do anything? Well, he's hurting. I think what he would want to do is probably try to find a way to combine forces again with like clear fate so what we could do is activate and he could go you know one two three four five six and join up here and because he's got engineers cavalry infantry three steps Infantry, yeah, this actually works out well. So he's going to end up here. So 
sort of an uber stack. And this end is moved here. Now, you might say, hey, Steve, you just vacated Flanders. Well, the thing is, if the French move up into here, you know, they, they have a clear path, but they're going to activate Britain, basically. Like, for them to... They could go around uh, Antwerp and, and uh, Brussels, but they're then going to have problems staying in supply, and then this stack had come up behind de Maurier. So um, the, the Austrians are, are going to take a move to consolidate forces, and that's it. All right, so I think that's it with that. With that shit, we can go on to the next one. And we get neutral naval, so nothing special there. Um, we'll go back to the cup. And winter quarters. So we got our first winter quarters. I'm going to set it aside. We'll pull another chip. We got Empire Land 1. So everything, and we'll put Winter Quarters back in the cup. So now, if after the Empire Land 1 marker, we pull Winter Quarters, the turn is over. And now this one allows everybody to activate, even the sole units by themselves. And this even means uh, that the guys who've gone once already can potentially go again. Um, but they will suffer an attrition. I think it's at the end of the move. I'll have to double check that. So... Um, I'm going to think about what I want to do here uh, because it will be kind of a tough, kind of a tough run, I think, no matter what we do. Um, yeah, let me think about this. Before we start actually moving the French forces around, given that we're talking about forced marches, and this is ultimately going to be leading us to talk about attrition table stuff, Thought it'd make sense to look at the actual attrition table and understand it a little bit better. Now, a force uh, suffers attrition if it is out of supply and tries to do stuff. Um, and in this case, it'll be, you know, a force that has already been activated will do an attrition roll, uh, attrition check, at the end of its movement or before a combat. But I think as long as you fight a combat... Uh, and you roll during that, you don't roll a second time at the end of movement. That's what it seems like to me if I read the rules right. Now, what this looks like is, like most of the checks in this game, a 2d6 die roll, and you can see you cross-reference the die roll against the number of steps you have. Pretty much all the stacks on the board don't number any more than four to six steps, so we're really looking at that column for the most part, and you can see that there's, a, there's at least some decent chance of not losing any steps in some cases, maybe moving losing one, and that star result basically means that you're you have a fifty percent chance of uh, uh, losing a step. So it's certainly a concern for the bigger steps, for the bigger stacks. But they're all there are die roll modifiers. So um, in winter rounds, it's a big problem. You get a plus four to the die roll, almost assuring you're going to lose something. Uh, if you spend time in certain terrain, it's a plus. If you manage to not move very much, so maybe you're only moving a hex or two to do a combat or to, to reorient yourself, you get a minus. If you're going all within your own home territory, that's a good minus. You can see being out of supply is very bad. Being demoralized is very bad. Um, extended movement during a, uh, a force march is... Uh, not great. And you can offset it with spending a whole supply wagon, which is awfully expensive. Um, but then you see there's also this uh, sort of nationality bonus. So if at least half the step point, step losses, or I guess it's strength points, but it's really each step is one strength point. If at least half are French, uh, and it is, yeah, it's a minus one. And then there's a certain band of time later in the game where it's a minus two for the French. The French will do even better. Um, so the French actually, depending on what they do, don't have to worry too, too much about attrition here. If they stay in the blue territory, uh, they will have a, a uh, 
minus three, which will basically make it um, almost impossible for them to really lose a big step. Um, so it's really all about like what what do we want to do? Where do we want to go? How do we want to handle this? Um, I think there's a certain certain couple of things that we could try to do. Um, try to move this guy over here and just have this whole stack be be done. Maybe that's the easiest thing to do. Um, and then elsewhere, boy, it's just really tricky. Um, if we activated uh, Montesquieu, he only has four steps. So he would end up rolling on the four to six column. Um, and if he went, you know, I'm kind of afraid to have him come over here because there's enough enemy forces nearby that could support that this could turn into a bad situation. And as you guys can see, my clipped counters slide so easily across each other. So this is kind of a whole scary little cluster of units. Uh, but I do think that uh, we want to have the French try to shut down Teshin with his gigantic force. It feels like one of the better things to try to do um, and sort of, you know, push this way and push the, uh, the Austrians kind of out. Um, but what's the best way to do that? Well, gosh, they've got a train, they've got engineers, they have one, two, three, four, five, five steps, two artillery, one cavalry, two leaders. <laughs> we're going to have to pull out all the stops if we're going to go out on a big offensive like that. Um, One, two, three, four, five. Hmm. The other thing we don't want to do is uh, create a situation where we've totally denuded ourselves. Um, so let me let me do some thinking off camera. I think we're going to do a, a spiffy maneuver um, to try to disrupt the Austrians with as much, with as many benefits as we can afford ourselves, and we'll see how it goes. It's about this time I'm really wishing that the French had an army marker, because that would make a lot of this so much easier to create big stacks, but uh, we haven't had a chance to create army markers yet. So uh, Maurier is swinging... Uh, over, I'm kind of moving these markers around, but he's moving down here to try to take Teshin. Teshin did not intercept and failed to avoid combat. Um, and so uh, it's, it's almost, I'm pretty certain, it's a dead even die roll here with both sides using subordinate leaders. Now the, it's plus three to both, but for different reasons. The French have a cavalry uh, superiority. The Austrians have a artillery superiority. Uh, the Austrians also have a better leading unit, uh, but they miss one for the failed avoid. Um, so we'll see what the French get. Uh, that's a good. That's a good one. Um, I should also point out that this is a minor battle, so the uh, morale will matter. So they got a nine plus three is. 12. So that's a 2 plus and a leader check. Um, so the French are going to have to double check their leader, so this could actually be, be bad. Um, and then the Austrians uh, also get a 12. So both sides have to lose two steps and make two leader checks. Aye, aye, aye. Um, 
Well, let's see. Austrians have to lose uh, their cavalry and an infantry step, which leaves them in pretty poor shape. Because now they've lost their cavalry. We'll do uh, a check for clear fate. And clear fate is wounded. And let me see what wounded means. Um, so I don't think we've had that yet. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Clear Fate is wounded, which means he'll come back in the spring phase. Um, the Austrians can pick a replacement leader from the leader pool, if there are any. Um, and I guess that should have happened for Argento too. All right, hold on, guys. I think there's a chance that I had a killed leader earlier that should have gotten a replacement, and I've lost track of where, so I'll, I'll have to look at it a little bit later. But uh, I'll just keep moving here. So we'll uh, what we'll do is we'll roll for the replacement leader under Teshin, and he survives. So we will we will get one for him, um, and maybe what we'll do maybe what we'll do is uh, we'll. What a bummer. Um, confusing situation. We'll, we'll look at that. We'll get him a backup leader in a second. For the French, they're going to lose a step off their infantry corps and one off their militia. And we'll have to roll for Kellerman. Possibly twice. He survives the first roll. And then uh, he is wounded on the second. So Kellerman, is, or I'm sorry, that's Luckner, not Kellerman. Luckner is wounded. Um, so let me get some replacement leaders and we'll see what the situation will be and whether or not uh, the French or the Austrians retreat. Because that was a bloody combat, two steps each. Okay, well, as it happened, um, as best as I could tell, the Austrians didn't have any extra leaders until 1990, or 1793, 1793. 1793, so now Teschen doesn't have a leader. We did have one for France, so Valence is in, but he is the only uh, leader I think that we could even afford to put in. And now it's a question of, uh, does somebody want to not fight a combat round? So it was tied. Um, I think the attacker, I mean, I think the advantage right now is to the French now. Um, the Austrians, have three steps, no cavalry, one artillery. The French have three steps, two cavalry, one artillery, so they'd have they would definitely be advantaged here. Um, and here is where we could actually see an advantage to having uh, uh, marching to the sound of guns because uh, De Maurier was going to overstack with these guys. They'd still probably overstack. So I, I think I think the Austrians need to retreat. I think they do. Um, so they're going to retreat, and they're going to have to hope that uh, they can get away. Their morale is a four. Um, and they pass, so they're gonna they're gonna beat a retreat, and they'll retreat back here. 
and Demurier is done moving for the turn. Um, so that was kind of, that was tricky, tricky. Um, so now you have this huge clump of, uh, of coalition forces, some of which are going to get to go again, uh, some will not. And so it's interesting to try to figure out like, what can we do? And I think what we'll do is, well, we'll keep these guys together. <laughs> it's so tough, guys. I think, I think that's it for the French move right now. The only thing I could do that I would even bother with, let's see, one, two, three, four, six, would be to try to move this guy in somewhere to join up. And provide some additional strength. And maybe that's what we do. Alternatively, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah. Yeah, none of these moves are great. I think I think we'll <laughs> I'm glad I'm having a hard time deciding, guys, but it's probably boring for you. Um, this guy needs to hold. This guy needs to hold to mutually support. Um, I think we'll move this guy for the first time and get him situated up here at Lille. And then we at least have some basic coverage so that we can't have these Prussians go one two, three, four, you know, get into Paris too easily. They've got to at least fight something, fight someone. Um, and we'll get an activation marker on him. And I think that's it. Um, so we'll, we'll let the cup now decide what happens next. And we get uh, Coalition Land 4, uh, which is a legitimate shit, but there are no leaders with a four activation. Oh, no, there is. There's Wormser. He's the only one who can activate right now. Um, and he could go one, two, no, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, or well, he's got a baggage train, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, One, two, three, four into Baden. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll move him into Baden. And then uh, one, two, three, four. He's got a roll attrition. And he'll have a minus one. And he's in the clear. So that was good for him. He's the only, I think he's the only leader they have with a four. I'm pretty sure everybody else is a three or a two. Yeah. All right, back to the cup. We get winter quarters, it's over. And we do. Winter, winter quarters. So that's the end of the activation phase for fall, which means that we missed out on Coalition 3, which means, I mean, we had... Empire 4, Coal or Coalition Land 1, Empire Land 3, Coalition Naval 1. So these are all the chits that did not get played due to the autumn weather. And you can see the Coalition actually missed out on uh, some more activations. So we could have seen some of these guys still activate a second time and try to push the French back. But so far, they've managed to get into a pretty good position. Um, now, the French have mostly been on defense, but I think they've managed to do reasonably well here. So there, there's that uh, over the course of the turn. Um, so let me do, let's see, is anybody demoralized? Uh, no. 
Um, any out of supply folks? No. Uh, the besieged uh, fortress of Strasbourg doesn't suffer attrition because the garrison is always fine and supplied. Um, let's see, conquest and peace phase. I don't think anything has happened here that matters. Everything is relatively stable for the moment. It, what is funny now is we had uh, this Austrian guy set up down here to attack Nice, and he didn't get his opportunity, which is funny. Um, yeah, he didn't get to go. He didn't get to attack Nice, so the French kind of lucked out on that one. Um, victory phase doesn't really matter, so there you go, guys. Um, I think we'll call it there. That is the uh, autumn turn, and I'll, I'll start taking some of these markers off just so you guys can appreciate the game situation a little bit better um, than what it is right now. probably be using my tweezers for this but yeah you can see there's a little bit of an oddball traffic jam and again we're, we're careful of entering brussels and antwerp for fear of generating uh, british aggression for the moment we will need to take it uh, we will need to take flanders at some point we could even be marching out uh, to holland and amsterdam which is really the only place we need to grab um, to basically take it a victory province, but uh, we have supply issues. So we're, it's sort of a weird cadence that we're entering here. But you can see we've managed to force the coalition back to these stacks that maybe we should try try to be attacking these guys. Um, for some reason, my printer's starting to do things when I didn't tell it to. So that's background noise you might be hearing right now. Um if these guys were to retreat into each other, there could be stacking issues and they lose units. So I think there is an incentive for the French to maybe to try to force some combats and cause these guys to have to uh, get thrown backwards a little bit. But generally, I'd say so far the French have done well on defense, which is what they really need to do. Um, man, I'm sorry for the printer, guys. Anyway, uh, sounds like it's almost done. <laughs> Maybe you guys can't hear that, but to me, it's a very distracting printer. Um, anyway, all right. Um, see ya. We'll uh, we'll catch you in the next one, guys. Uh, take care. Keep gaming. Next turn will be the winter of 1792.